live in a society today where we take care of our senior people. If you have a grandparent or a grandmother, there may have been times when you needed to care for them. Your own mom or your own dad that you kind of watched over them, you took care of them. You, some people may have uh, even put their parents or, or grandparents in a, in a nursing home and visited them and tended to them. Uh, and we take that for granted. We have uh, great health care. We have uh, the ability, ability, ability and availability to take care of our older people. As we look at this passage of Scripture, though, we're going to see something that was a little different. And it wasn't meant to be that way, but because of, tr of people's traditions, they began to take advantage of their parents. I want us to look at the passage of Scripture, beginning with verse 1. And if you're able, I ask that you stand out of respect to the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and crutches, or couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do, you, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold a tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban that is dedicated to the temple, and you no longer let him do anything with his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. And we thank you for the blessings of life that you show us. And Lord, as we look into this word, we ask that you reveal yourself to us. Lord, show us the truth about this passage of Scripture and what it really means to honor you, Father. Lord, thank you for the cross on Calvary's hill. And Lord, because of that cross, give us the strength and courage to give you the honor that is due your precious and holy name and your precious actions that you did for us. Thank you, Father God. For we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Tradition or truth? That becomes the question. I want you to know that verse 7 is the key to understanding this passage of Scripture. Look with me in verse 7 of our text, and it says, In vain they worship me. Now that's where we're going, and you're going to understand when we get down to the rest of it, the understanding about honoring your father and mother is based on what you believe about God. Do you believe the truth about God, or do you just want what you want? Think about it. Do you believe what the Bible says, or do you just want to do what you want to do? That you don't care about anybody else as long as you can have what you want, and nobody messes with you. That's what it's about. And Jesus is coming to that point to where something has to be done. Now look with me at the passage of Scriptures that you'll see on the screen. We're going to start in Mark chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 28 through 34. Mark 12, beginning with verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? 
And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as thyself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So when Jesus saw that He answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far, notice that, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask a question of Him. The key to that is he was not far. Understand that the scribe that he's talking to are the religious leaders of the day. This is a religious lawyer that interpreted the scriptures and he should have known the scriptures and he gave an answer to Jesus who knows the heart of men and Jesus replied, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Do you understand what that means? He's not in the kingdom of God. He's at the door, and he has an opportunity, but he is not in the kingdom of God. All across this great land that we live in today, there are people that are gathering together. They are worshiping in the set of a congregation. And in that congregation, there are many people that have received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But also in that congregation are many people who are not far from the kingdom of God. They hear the word of God, they understand the word of God, but they have not decided to put their faith and their trust in Jesus. Today you need to decide which group you're in. Because we have gathered here today, and I dare say that there are people here that are Christians that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that lift up worship that is real, and they want Christ to be first in their lives. But I also dare say that there may be people here who are close, who come to worship, who understand, but have not committed. Which group are you in? Look with me in Isaiah chapter 1. How can this be? So in Isaiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 10, the great prophet writes, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams. And the fat of fed and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more brutal sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. Notice what he says. I can not endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Isaiah's writing what God has laid down for him to write. And he says, here are the things that are going on. And understand what they, what they mean. Christ or God says, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams. I've had enough of the offering of the fat of the cattle. I have enough of you bringing me stuff. I have enough of you wanting to just please me with the things that you do. And what I need is a sinless offering of your soul. He's had enough. What is your view of worship? He's had enough. Go with me to Proverbs. 
chapter 21 and verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. He doesn't want what you have. How much more when he brings it with wicked intent? He doesn't want what you have. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants your trust. Can you give that to God? The last two sermons I preached on Sunday mornings, we talked about feeding the thousands and how He met the people's needs. And last week we talked about Christ, how He walked on the water, how He could see those straining as He was on the mountaintop. He could see the individuals straining at the oars. He knows our predicaments. He knows what's going on in our lives. He understands our circumstances. And He meets us at our point of need. He comes to us in our hour of crisis. Friends, I want you to hear this. God wants to be in your life. God wants to meet you. in whatever circumstances are causing you trouble and whatever circumstances are causing you joy, He wants to meet you there. Can you let Him? Can you let Him? Look at our text this morning. And very quickly, we're going to go through this text. You come to verse 1, and there's a transition word at the very start of the verse. It says, then. It lets us know that He's gone from walking on the water, and there's something else that He wants us to understand. Then, it changes the thought. It takes us from the truth that versus the tradition. Truth versus tradition. Follow me. Number one, the dilemma. Look at verses one through five. In the dilemma, the Pharisees and some of the scribes come together to Jesus and they have come from Jerusalem. That lets us know what kind of people they are. And they are on a mission. They're to find out about Christ and what is going on with Christ. And so as we begin to look at it, we begin to see that they have some problems that they've spotted immediately as they come. Here they are, and there's thousands of people around Christ, but they notice the twelve disciples. And when they saw some of the disciples in verse 2 eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they begin to find fault. They're looking for a reason to get after Christ. They're looking for a reason to get after the disciples because they are losing power and they're losing favor with the people. And here is Christ who's growing in popularity and His disciples are with Him. And so these religious rulers have come down to try to figure out how they can stop what's going on. And the first thing they see is these people are not eating with washed hands. Now we teach our children from the very beginning to wash their hands, right? Y'all know, young people, you know if you go to the dinner table, you are to wash your hands, right? Because we understand in our society today that there are germs. And you want to get the germs off your hand. I remember going to my grandmother's table many, many years ago when I was a little lad. And I just decided I'd just reach up there and get me a roll as I walked by the table. I didn't know she had a fly swatter that close. And so I realized at that point that I had messed up. That's not what it's talking about. It is a ceremonial washing. As a matter of fact, the word for unwashed hands there is fist. And they had a certain way that they were to wash their hands to clean them spiritually in that sense, or ceremonially. They, they were washing their hands as a fist. They were washing the outside, not the inside. They wanted everything to be clean before the Lord. Often they will hold their hands up like this toward the Lord. We often see them, people emphasizing that their hands would be open to receive the blessing, but they did it like this because they wanted to hold on to God. And so here we are. And here are these Pharisees and scribes, and they're saying there's something 
for all. There's a dilemma for them. And they're trying to sway the people. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, they go on to say when they come from the marketplace, talking about the Pharisees, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received, and it goes through the cups, the couches, the, the pitchers, the copper vessels, anything that they might use, they lay down and recline to eat on. These things must be washed a certain way. Then verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why don't they do what everybody else has done? But they eat with unwashed hands. Why can't they just be like everybody else? That's the question. Why can't you just be like everybody else? Now, I want you to hear this. And I want you to get this. If you don't get anything else today, you get this thought right here, right now. Here it is. When Christ calls you, He calls you to be what? Different. You are to be different from the world. You are not to take part in the things of the world. You're not to be caught up in sexual immorality. You're not to be caught up in, in abortions. You're not to be caught up in the things that the Bible says are wrong and the world says they're okay. He has called you to be different. And so when, they, when the Pharisees and scribes look at the disciples and he says, why can't they just be like everybody else? We know the answer because Christ makes us different. Now here's the question. I hope I've gotten your attention. Are you different? Are you different? When people look at you in our society today, are you different from them? Do people realize they can trust you and you're not going to be doing the things that everybody else does? Do, do people, when they look at you, know if they tell you something, you'll keep it in confidence, because not because you love them, but because you love God? When people ask you to pray for them, are you different enough to say, yes, I am, and then every day of the week, morning, noon, and night, you'll lift them up in prayer? Are you different? Because if you're not, you're like the Pharisees and the scribes. And you know what Jesus calls them? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. What a dilemma. Jesus, your disciples are different. Can't you get them in line? I'm glad they didn't get in line. Notice the second point, beginning with verse 6. Jesus denounced them. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. See, I didn't make that up. It is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, they care nothing about the Word of God. That's the negative of it, right? They think that what people say is more important than what the Word of God actually states. We allow society to tell us what is right and what is wrong. And we don't have to do that. Because we are different. Because we have the Word of God that sets down in stone that shall not be moved and shall last forever. The quality of Christians. What is your quality? What kind of life are you living? Do you trust God's Word? Do you believe every word of it to be true? That's what the, the situation boils down to. Do you believe the Word of God? 
that every word in it is true. I believe every word in it is true. I, I believe that I can stand on the Word of God because if there's one word wrong in it, you know what word it is? For God so loved me. You say, well, no, I'll preach is not that word. It's something else. That we don't believe Jonah was in the whale's belly. Well, if Jonah wasn't in the whale's belly, God doesn't love you. Every part of it is true or none of it is true. If you can't believe every word of it, you can believe none of it. Do you believe the Word of God to be the inerrant, infallible Word? Is it the grinding force in your life? Let nothing else guide a Christian but God's Word. Nothing else. You know what really bothers me? Brother... Brother Andy, we know what the Bible says, but, but, if we're going to be a strong church, if we're going to be different, there can be no buts. I understand what God, God, God's Word says. I understand what it means. I understand that it's hard to do. I understand that we'll never be perfect people. I understand that. But I understand what God requires. And there's never an excuse not to try to live up to the requirements. I got to spend some time on Paris Island a few years back. Uh, with Chuck Bursier, some of y'all may have remembered Chuck. He was in Lauderdale County. He was a Marine. He ended up maybe a, I don't know, a general. I don't know. But we were friends, and our family went, and we stayed on Saipan Road. And he took me around. We spent a few days there, and he took me around the base. And, man, I'm telling you, it's just amazing what these Marines have done. Some of you Marines, uh, any Marines here? Bill, did you go to Paris Island? Did you have to climb that rope? Did it give you gloves? Did that rope bite into your hands? You know what he told me? When the rope got smooth, they'd take it down. They did. He said, because they got to suffer to get to the top. That's what he told me. I, I mean, it's a tough deal. They have requirements. And to reach the goal to come out and be a graduate of that boot camp, they don't lessen the requirements. And they fight to keep us safe. And I'm proud of my military. I want you to hear that before I say this. But the church, we have a better battle going on. It's bigger. It's devastating. And souls are being lost every day. And we cannot lessen the requirements of a Christian. And when somebody tells you that they don't believe that part of the Bible, you separate yourself from them. We believe in the truth. I believe every word of it. And because I believe in it, I can trust God to see me through the good times and the bad times. And when I'm in a boat and I'm pulling on the oars like those disciples in the storms of life, I know that Christ is looking at me and He's watching me and He's there to meet me in my point of need. Some people don't understand that. And so these Pharisees and these scribes, as He calls hypocrites, they don't understand. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Therefore, the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Why do we stand in need of judgment? It's not because of the word of God, but because of the commandments of men. 
Why do we put up with what goes on in this world? Why are they taking prayer out of school? Why is there abortions? Why is there sexual immorality? Why is there filthy language on TV? It's because we fear the commandment of man more than we fear the commandment of God. And it's time for that to change. And it changes with each individual where you sit today. Are you willing to change? Are you willing to stand for what's right? Are you willing to make a difference in the land that we live in? Are you willing to get involved and stand for Christian principles? It starts on our level. It doesn't start in Washington. It starts right here. Right here. Make a difference one soul at a time. That's how you do it. Are you willing? It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Verse 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the traditions of men, and the washing of the outside and of cups, but not of the heart. It's a heart issue. Look at the third point. I want you to see this, and we're going to close pretty quickly. Look with me in verse 10. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Honor your father and mother. Give them the respect that's due them. They brought you into this world. Not everybody has a father and mother that loves them. I understand that. We live in a fallen world. But you still need to give them respect. Respect. In Jesus' day, it got to the point where the children would take all their funds and they would give it to the temple and the temple would watch over it. And then they would come to the temple when their parents needed something and they would say, we need to take care of our parents. But the Pharisees would say, Corbin. Let me give you an example of Corbin. A few years back, I had a friend who had a daughter that was going to dental school over at the University Medical Center in Jackson. And you know, if you're in that dental school, if any of you have been a dentist or something like that, you know they have to have people to work on in that dental school. And so they called and won't know if I would come over and let her work on my teeth. Well, I did. And that was a mistake. <laughs> no, it wasn't. She put on a tooth, and I left, and got down the road, it fell off. I mean, here to Collinsville, it fell off. So I went back, and they put me on a gold tooth. I got a gold tooth in here. And I get home, and my son Andrew, I walked in, I showed him a tooth, and I said, son, it's gold. He looked over at my daughter, and he said, dibs. He said, Daddy, when they put you in the casket, I'm going to get me a pair of pliers, I'm going to get that gold tooth. <laughs> That's what it is, dibs. They'd go to the temple and need some money to take care of the parents, and the Pharisee says, dibs? We call dibs. We're going to take care of the temple with that. Dedicate it. And so the Bible says, take care of your father and mother. And you Pharisees understand it says, take care of your father and mother. But you're more worried about the money and taking care of yourself. You're more worried about your traditions and your commandments and having people like you and follow you and want to be around you. And you don't want to do what God tells you to do. Because God has the real dibs. You understand that? He's called dibs on everybody that has given their soul to Christ. And Satan wants it. But he says, dibs. And he closes up. Notice verse 11. That Corbin is dibs. Verse 12. And you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through what you want to do, which you're handing down 
and many such things you do. You see, the father and mother is just one thing. There are many such things that you're doing. You know what hypocrites need to do? You know what hypocrites need to do? Paul said, I'm the chief sinner. That great apostle Paul said, I was going into the, te- into the synagogues and I was dragging out these Christians and I was putting them in chains and taking them to Jerusalem so we could kill them. And you know what Paul had to do? What did Paul do? He repented. He repented. You're doing what you want to do. You're deciding, I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what the Word of God says. This is what you need to do. Repent. Preacher, who are you to tell me what I need to do? I'm telling you what the Word of God says you've got to do. It's not about what the preacher says, how the preacher preaches, how he looks, what he eats for lunch. It's about what the Word of God says to do. You're supposed to do it. And Christians do it. So this morning, if you're lost and without Christ, you need to come to Christ. If you're lost and Christ is not your Savior, if you're being disobedient to the Word of God, you hate the Bible, you hate what the Bible tells about you, and the Bible stepping all over your feet this morning, you need to give your life to Christ. Christians, sometimes we get kind of hard to the Word. Sometimes we get caught in a rut and we begin to say, well, that's all right. Let me tell you, it's not all right. It is not all right. Do you love God? How much do you really love God? Are you willing to give up your sins for Christ who died for your sins? Do you really love Him? Make that decision today. Do you really love Christ? Today is the day of salvation. Think about that this morning. Think about it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for this day. We thank you for the blessings of life that you give us. For love, grace, and mercy that you send our way. And Father, today, Lord, as we humble ourselves before you, I ask that your Holy Spirit begins to work in our heart today. Lord, if your word has touched that heart, massaged that heart, and Father, I pray that if that heart is lost, that you pull that old stony heart out and you put in a heart of flesh today. Lord, we all stand before you in need. We stand before you in need of grace, in need of love, in need of encouragement. So, Father, meet us at our point of need today. Oh, God, be good to us. We love you, Father God, and it's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray.